So, welcome everybody to the Eradicate Your Knee Pain Workshop. I appreciate you guys coming and, uh, and hearing what we have to say here and uh, learning a little bit more about knee pain and, and what you can do about it. So, we'll kind of jump right on in. Um, first thing, I am Justin Thompson, a physical therapist, uh, owner of Thompson Physical Therapy and a graduate of the University of Florida, doctor of physical therapy program. Uh, certified manual physical therapist, former collegiate soccer player, and husband to Jody, who's sitting right back here. And so, what does all that mean? Well, not a whole lot, but what it does mean is, is that uh, I help people reduce pain and move with freedom. Okay, that includes knee pain, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, so, some of the objectives of today. I want to teach you today about knee pain. The reason why I want to do that is because it's one of the most uh, often seen things in my practice. Um, and I help people with this all of the time, all the time, day in and day out. And I want to show you examples uh, today of how the pain in your knee may not even be caused um, by the knee itself, but it could actually be um, originating in other places. And so at this workshop, so at the workshop you're going to learn uh, the basics of how the knee works and some descriptions of common injuries that you're going to see in the knee. Um, learn three simple strategies that are going to help you transform your knee health and then learn how to kind of systematically improve your knee health through improving mobility, control, and strength in the knee. Uh, you're also going to receive your complimentary happy knee kit, which you already have there with you, and we're going to actually use that a little bit today. Okay. So, who is everybody here? I want to I wanna know who you guys are, where, where you're from, uh, what led you to, to join us here today, and, um, and then what do you want to take away from this workshop? So, I'm going to start right here. Dawn, uh, well, I might as well just say here, because I moved to Florida in 79 um, from up north, um, chronic pain, and from doing what you really want to do, chronic pain. It feels like it goes in a different direction sometimes. Uh, well, helping myself, things I can do home to prevent uh, inflammation, pain, um, prevent surgery, hopefully. Absolutely. Staying off the surgery table is kind of the, the yeah. main <laughs> thing most people want. So um, that's great. Thank you so much, Don. <laughs> And Danielle, Danielle um, hairstylist, so I'm on my knees, well, not on my knees, but on my feet, <laughs> but use my knees all day long and just looking to prevent things from happening because I still have a lot more years of work to do, so <laughs> that's me. Good deal. <laughs> and I'm Karen, and I just moved here from Waco, Texas, um, and I had a knee injury this summer, so I've been trying to figure out what kind of exercises I can do that don't injure, that don't hurt my knee. And I've been doing some PT at home, but I still feel pain every once in a while, so I wanted to come and see what else I could learn <coughs> to, yeah, I don't want surgery. And <laughs> I'm a teacher, I teach fourth grade, so I'm walking around standing all day long, and yeah, I hope to take away more tools that I can use at home. Perfect. Ready? All right, and that's <coughs> tools like exercises and some of the things that you have here that we can take um, and uh, and hopefully be able to do some of these things at home on your own and, and maintain your health uh, of your knees. So what do I normally see every day in my practice? Um, typically, I see things like pain on the inside or the outside of the knee, usually one or the other, sometimes it's more like it's inside the knee joint itself. Um, and then I'll also feel like uh, a lot of people tell me that they have pain that gets worse with long periods of standing. Danielle, I know you stand a lot, so you may end up having 
pain during those times. Um, knees that get stiff with long periods of sitting as well, so long periods of immobility, um, just force your knees to kind of get stiff and hard to move again. Muscles around the knee start to feel pretty tight and, and tender. And, uh, and movement of the knee tends to help it. However, too much movement can actually aggravate it, right? So it's kind of finding this, this kind of a balance. And then um, specific movements cause pain, whether that's a certain way that you bend or twist or, or, or straighten it out. Uh, or a certain thing that you do while you're while you're walking or something like that. So does all that sound familiar at Definitely. all to anybody? <laughs> okay. So I hear you. It can affect the way that you live for sure. Absolutely, and it keeps you from doing the things that you want to do. Keeps you uh, from doing your normal daily activities without having discomfort. Keeps you from doing some sort of exercise program for maintenance and things of that sort as well and then it can prevent you from doing social or family outings too which is is pretty tough on you mentally as well as as well as physically so it's time to do something about it so let's take a look at some of the things that we can do so let's take a look first at the knee itself what you're going to find though is i'm going to move from the knee into other parts of the body too because as i said earlier it's maybe not just the knee that's causing the problem but other places kind of above and below the knee as well. So the knee joint looks like a simple hinge joint, right? It moves, it bends, it straightens, it bends, it straightens, okay? And if you look at the knee just by itself, yeah, it, it, it looks like a simple hinge and it should be a, a fairly simple um, knee to, or simple joint to be able to treat. However, you can see, first of all, the anatomy of it doesn't look exactly like a hinge. So there's, so there's other ways that it's kind of structured. It's not like there's a pin in it that the, that the joint is actually rotating around. So you'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of the knee here in just a minute. Um, but also what I want you to know is the knee doesn't just work by itself. The knee works um, as an entire kinetic chain. So a kinetic chain is just the movement at the knee is also dictated by movement at other joints in the body, okay? All the way from the ground, all the way up to your, your top of your head, okay? So I wanna show you this video real quick of what's going on whenever you're walking, what's going on at the knees and everything else around it. So as you're walking, you can kinda see the, yes, the knee is moving straight forward and backward. It's bending, it's straightening, it's bending, it's straightening. But you can also see that the hips are moving. The ankles are moving. And not very well depicted in this video, but the lumbar spine is moving and everything else is, is moving around it as well. So you've got all these muscles that are pulling fr uh, from different areas, okay? And they're not just pulling forward and back, they're pulling side to side, all the way from, from up here in your leg, all the way down to your lower leg as well, and all the way up into your hips and glutes. Okay, so you can kind of see everything that's working there and, and kind of what's going on. So then what's the point? The knee is the dummy between the hip and the ankle, basically. Okay, and you know, the reason I call it the dummy because it's very, very simple. It's supposed to bend and straighten, and that's it, okay? Now, if we take a look at the motion of the hip, you can see that it moves forward, it moves to the side, it rotates, it moves backwards, it, it kind of goes all over the place. It's got a bunch of degrees of motion, while the knee itself just has one motion forward and backward take a look over here at the ankle and you'll see something very similar. It moves up and down, forward and back, side to side. It can actually rock in and out as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's called pronation and supination. So if this is supposed to go here, but these go 
kind of in different directions, what's the effect on the knee joint then? All right, so how are those going to affect that? So there it is, the dummy between the hip and the ankle. Okay. So <laughs> I went back and forth between Mr. Bean or, or Ernest, so I, I settled on Ernest. He was good. <laughs> So you may be asked, saying, but when I walk, everything goes forward, uh, not, not side to side. True. However, maybe not completely. All right, so let's start down low. Let's start at the ankle joint, and we'll kind of work our way up. So a neutral foot, everything is stacked up on top of each other, nice and, nice and straight, okay? However, we also have this motion called pronation, and then we can also go the other way into supination. So when you pronate, your foot rocks to the inside, and then what can happen then is your arch of your foot can actually fall down, it can fall flat. When you supinate, which actually happens when you push off the ground during your walking, your arch comes back, and it actually rotates out to the other side, okay? Now, so here's kind of from the inside angle, so inside of the foot, a pronated foot, the foot falls flat, and then in a supinated foot, the arch raises back up, okay? Now, our foot's designed to do both. It's designed to pronate a little bit, it's designed to supinate a little bit, okay? So, the problem is, you can have excessive pronation. So pronation is where that foot falls flat, right? So it can lead to flat feet, poor arch support, poor arch integrity, all right? And whenever you don't have that good arch integrity, you lose that neutral foot. And I'll talk a little bit about what happens when that ankle starts rolling inward, what that can do to the knee. So some of the limitations, first of all, that can lead to that excessive pronation there's a lot of muscular control at, at the foot and ankle. Okay, so all the way up, up in here, you can see that there's muscles that go from the lower leg all the way down into the foot and actually wrap under the arch, acting to lift it and support the arch itself. Okay, I won't go into the names of the muscles necessarily, but those, those muscles help to lift and, and lift the arch up. Now you've also got these intrinsic muscles inside of the foot that act to hold the arch in place too, okay? So we've got our foot muscles and lower leg muscles that all need to be working properly in order to maintain a nice neutral foot. Another limitation that can actually lead to that excessive pronation is a lack of mobility in your ankle joint itself, okay? So plantar flexion is where you point your toes down towards the floor, okay? So P, point, good way to remember that. Plantar flexion, pointing the foot down into the floor. That is usually not limited necessarily. It can be, but oftentimes it's not. It's usually the dorsiflexion, so lifting the toes up towards your shin that is usually fairly limited, okay? so. Typically, in order to be able to walk well without having a significant uh, arch drop in the foot, you need at least about 10 degrees for normal walking. And if you're running or something like that, you need about 20 degrees, maybe a little bit more. Okay? So, the way that kind of affects your foot and ankle and your knee can actually be because of the way that you are walking over your foot. So if you're watching me here, if as you walk, you translate over your ankle and you need that good mobility in the ankle. If you don't have that and there's like a block here, what's going to happen is our body is smart and it's going to try and compensate. And it's going to compensate by turning outward and rolling inward in order to get your knee forward during your walking motion. Okay, so if you see somebody that walks a lot like this and their foot falls flat and they're rolling off the inside of the foot, it may be because they have this limitation in their dorsiflexion motion. They can't drive their knee directly over their toes. Okay, 
So what's the effect that that has on the knee then? Okay, so let's take a look. So as you step, normal neutral knee bends and straightens, right? However, if you start having to turn your foot out and rocking your foot in, and your knee is still going forward, there's a twisting motion going on at the knee, okay? So you don't necessarily want this twisting motion at the knee, all right? So looking up here at the slide, pronation at the foot leads to rotation at the tibia, which is your shin bone, okay? So it rotates at the tibia there, and then there's a valgus or medial knee stress. So what that means is as you are rolling in this way, the knee dives inward here, okay? Which f puts a little bit of a pull and a strain on the medial side, the inside of the knee, all right? So when you get that, as I'm doing this right now, it doesn't hurt me a darn bit. However, you do this over and over and over again, thousands of steps in a day, days in a year, and just keep going and going and going for years on end, this is gonna cause problems, okay? And it also causes some uneven pressures within the joint of the knee itself. So remember, as I, as I bring the knee over this way, it stretches on the inside of the knee, opening that side of the knee up, and actually closing this side of the knee down, okay? So there's more pressure on the outside of the knee than there is on the inside of the knee right now, okay? Well, as I do that. So, the effect of pronation on the knee, it's, it causes a lot of different forces that the knee wasn't designed to take. So we'll move from the foot up into the hip. So lateral hip weakness is actually gonna cause a lot of the same kind of problems at the knee as it does, as, as the foot does to the knee. So let's, let's think a little bit about your glute activation. So we sit a lot in our culture. We tend to sit um, and our glutes are fairly weak in general. A lot of people's are anyway. And if you're not actively working on them, they, they can become so weak that you can't stabilize and support your pelvis and it actually causes a lot of the same problems at the knee. So what are those, those problems that it can cause? First of all, you can it can cause a little bit of a hip drop. So if this isn't strong enough to maintain good stability at the hips, it's gonna force your hip to drop down and, and cause problems even at the hip as well, okay? And then what it's also gonna do with the, with the hip, the glute muscles also activate in order to rotate your leg to the outside. So again, if you're walking and you don't have the stability at the hip, if you're to, to be able to hold you into rotation, then it's gonna dive inward again. Okay, so you've got this rotation and this stress coming on the inside of the knee because of the lateral hip weakness as well. So you put the two of these things together, down here at the foot, up here at the hip, you've got a lot of, a lot of issues um, that, are, uh, that are being kind of amplified by each other. Okay, so that's why a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna show you today is gonna be focused a lot at the hip and the knee, or the hip and the ankle, because that is what I'm talking about whenever I said that, you know, oftentimes the problems at the knee aren't necessarily due to the knee itself, it's due to the joints above and below it, okay? So what are some of the uh, knee injuries then that can be caused um, by these awkward forces that are being put on the knee? So we'll take a look at some of these. I wanna look specifically at an internal derangement, which I'll explain a little bit here in just a second. And then you have a lot of ligaments and tendons that cross over the knee joint, and you can get damage in a lot of these because of those abnormal stresses. And then also, over time, you can end up with knee osteoarthritis and, and problems of that sort, and we'll, we'll go into a little bit more of that as well. So what is internal derangement? Internal derangement is a, is a damage of the meniscus, okay? And I know you mentioned that you have uh, problems with your meniscus, and um, so we'll talk a little bit about this here. Because of these abnormal forces that are being put 
on the knee, we're getting these abnormal stresses inside the knee joint and the twisting motion is not, is not something that, uh, that the knee was designed to take. The meniscus was designed to cushion the knee to some degree to, to uh, increase the surface area of the knee so that, the, um, so that there's not too much force inside of it. However, if we go to bend and straighten the knee, the, um, the forces are going to kind of be rocked back and forth on the knee itself. So you can see as the knee's moving, when it's bent, the force is a little bit more on the back side of the knee, and then as it straightens up, the force is a little bit more on the front side of the knee. So the meniscus can take you know, a, a little bit of this extra force. However, if we start twisting on it, the meniscus wasn't designed to take that. Okay, So we, we have a little bit of motion at, at the knee and rotation, but that doesn't mean it was necessarily designed to do it. And so what can happen is, as you go and step and twist, the knee can actually grab onto the meniscus and start pulling on it in, in strange ways. And it can cause a tear, it can cause fraying, it can cause just general degradation of the meniscus itself. Okay, so that's internal derangement. So then tendon and ligament damage. So as I said, there's a lot going on at the, at the knee in terms of what's kind of holding it all together. So we, we're going to look first at um, the tendons because it's, it's a little more surface level. I can kind of show you these real quick. So if you look at the patellar tendon, so this is your patella or your kneecap, and you've got your quadriceps that's coming down and attaches to the patella, actually wraps over top of it and comes down and attaches to your shin. Okay. Again, this is oriented up and down and it was designed to go for straight up and down. Okay? It wasn't designed to pull at different angles. Okay? However, if we're putting weird stresses on it, so this is that medial stress that I talk about whenever we're, whenever we're walking and we have these, these forces on the knee. What can happen is you start pulling in this C shape on the tendon, which it wasn't designed to do. And it's going to try to pull straight. It's going to try to. So what that could end up causing is if it's doing something it's not supposed to do, it's going to cause inflammation in the tendons itself. But it can also start pulling the kneecap over in order to try and pull straight too. Okay, so you don't necessarily want that either. Okay, so you can get the, these inflamed tendons that are angry because they're being pulled in the wrong direction. Secondly, you can get the stresses on the ligaments as well. So we're looking here at the ligament. This is your medial collateral ligament. On the inside of the knee. So that's the, the ligament that's going to get stretched whenever you're rolling towards the inside of the knee. Okay. If that's getting stretched out, then it was designed to take some stress, but not designed to take a lot of stress, and especially not repeated over and over and over again. And it can get stretched out. It can get stretched out and get inflamed and painful. All right? And then at the same time, you can end up with this side just getting tighter and tighter and tighter, too, because it's not taking the same amount of stress the other way, so it can actually shorten that bottom on you a little bit. And then you're also getting stresses on the inside of the knee joint too in your ACL or your anterior cruciate ligament. Okay, so it was designed to, to help you prevent with motion in your knee going forward and back this way, all this excessive glide here. It wasn't designed to twist necessarily. Okay, so. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at kind of the tendon and ligament damage that can occur at the knee joint. So then what can happen over time because of all these strange forces that are being put on the knee joint itself is you can end up with some osteoarthritis and, and problems like that. So the thing about the body is when you put a stress on it, 
it's going to react in a certain way. It's, and a lot of times the reaction is going to be to lay down more tissue. So whenever you're putting stresses on the bones in a way that they're not supposed to be put on it, you can get wear and tear, and then the body is going to start trying to lay down more calcium and more tissue, and it's, you're actually going to get these little extra bone growths in there. I'm talking about bone spurs. Um, that's, what you're, that's what you're looking at. You've got these excessive forces that are causing the body to put down more tissue that is trying to protect you, but in the end, it's really not. Okay. So again, you can get the cartilage worn. The cartilage can start to wear down. The cartilage doesn't have a lot of nerve supply. Okay. The cartilage doesn't have a lot of nerve supply, so there's not a lot of pain signals being sent to the brain. However, once you wear through that cartilage, the bone has a lot more nerves inside of it. So then, that's when you know you go to your doctor and they say you got bone on bone. You know that's probably why you got all this pain. Okay, well because the bones are actually have a lot more of a nerve supply than the cartilage itself, okay? So this can happen inside of the knee joint. It can also happen behind your kneecap, okay? So you've got this retropatellar arthritis that can be caused. Remember when I talked about the tendons pulling at weird angles and it can pull the kneecap off to the side, putting weird stresses on the front side of the knee too, okay? So then, as that kneecap keeps sliding over, sliding over, sliding over, it's rubbing and rubbing and rubbing in a way that it wasn't designed to rub. And eventually that cartilage will wear down in the front side of the knee too, and then you'll end up with a possible bone-on-bone -bone scenario at the end of that, okay? So, how do we prevent? How do we treat? these type of conditions. All right. So, kind of the methods that I use to help improve the ability of your knee to, to do things a little bit more normally. I use a three R's method. Okay, first I try to do what I can to remove the pain and then we try and restore the capacity of the knee to do the things that it needs to do. And then we actually make it into a little bit more of a return to function, which is more functional stuff, the things that you want to be able to do. And, and, you know, things more like actually walking rather than just doing strength training exercises. Okay? So, we'll go a little bit more over this now. So, it's a nine step process and I kind of put step in quotes because these can kind of mix in together as, as you're going through. Okay, and you guys, you guys have this so you can kind of see it as well. Um, so we'll go through here real quick and I'll just show you kind of my method of going through things. So first of all, you come in for a physical therapy evaluation. I do all the assessments and things that we need to do to find out what in the world is actually going wrong with the knee. Is it a tendon problem? Is it a ligament problem? Is it arthritis? Is it, you know, what is it that's going wrong? And then I try and use manual therapy techniques, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you kinda some of the things that you can do as well to help improve uh, the ability to move and do things without pain, which is the next step, moving without pain. So you wanna first take away the pain to some, at least to the point where you can move well, and then get to the point where you can move as much as you need to without pain, so that you can then move into what I call my moving and grooving phase, okay? So I call it that because you're actually trying to groove a new movement pattern into, into your nervous system, okay? So you're trying to improve a motor pattern that's different from the one that caused you the problems in the first place. Okay, so we have to retrain the body to do the things that we want it to do rather than the things that it's been doing for months, weeks, years, however long it's been. Okay, 
So, and it's also the stage where you're improving the endurance of the muscles and getting them prepped and building, building a, a, a base on which you can do some of the other things as well. So then you, you improve your stability and balance, so you can actually start working on balance stuff and things like that, so that you, know, you have full and total control over the knee. And then you want to resist further injury through strength training. You want to support the knee. You want to give it the proper strengthening that it needs in order to, uh, to make sure that it doesn't get injured again. From there, we go into the return to function phase. Um, so I usually start people with some sort of a walking program where they're concentrating on a lot of these other things above as they're starting to move into, into that new return, re that return to function phase. And then you're continuing on moving towards your goals and then you reach your ultimate goal. Whether that goal is, if, it, if your goal is just to walk, then great. How far do you want to walk? You know, what is your ultimate goal? Do you want to be able to walk 20 minutes? Do you want to be able to go run a 5K? Do you, what do you want as your ultimate goal? Okay, so that's what we're kind of working towards. All right, so there's my three R's kind of method for moving you uh, from one step to the next. This is what I want to focus on today, okay? So I want to look at how you can kind of help yourself to work out those kinks and do some of the manual therapy stuff for yourself and then help you kind of gain the, the ability to move without pain and then show you some things that you can do to kind of start that endurance and that motor learning pattern um, again so that you can start to retrain the, uh, the muscles and, and, and your knee to be able to act the way that it needs to act to prevent further injury. So we'll start with the manual therapy component. So you can come in and see me and I can work you out. Okay, I can, I can get kind of dug in. If there's tight muscles that need to be loosened up, I get in there and I work those out. If there are um, you know, certain, uh, certain joint mobilizations that need to happen, I can get in there and work that too. Okay? Now, you can also do some things on your own which is what I want to show you a little bit today. And you've got, that should look familiar, that's what you got today uh, for tools that you can use to, uh, to help you with your, with your uh, knee problems right now, okay? So I'll show you some self-mobilization techniques that you can use. So let me uh, demonstrate some of that, okay? So everybody, I want you to take out one of those uh, one of those balls in there that you have. And I'm kind of taking a front and center stage here. So. Do you have a preference on which one? Well, it's going to depend on feel. So you might just take them both out and then see how see how it goes. And so when you're doing menial therapy at the knee, you want to make sure that you're hitting the muscles that you need to hit, okay? You want to make sure that you're hitting everything on the front, on the front side of the thigh, the back side of the thigh, the front side of the lower leg, and the back side of the lower leg to kind of hit all of the, the necessary areas, okay? So your hamstrings on the back, the quads on the front, the calves down below, and then the anterior tibialis is the muscle right here on the front of your shin. Okay, so what I want to do first is show you what you can do for the hamstrings. And I like to use kind of a pin and move kind of technique for the hamstrings. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the ball, whichever one's most comfortable, so you, you're going you're gonna to try them out. All right, and you're going to put it right underneath your hamstring. If there are any tender spots or achy areas, Found one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all tender. <laughs> it's all tender. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to kind of hold it in there and you're going to start to actually move the knee itself. Okay. And what that does is it actually mobilizes the, the muscle itself. And you can do about 10 movements here on a certain spot. And then if you have other spots, you can move the ball over to other spots as well. 
start moving. How far up from the knee? Not right in the socket there, but not right behind the knee. No, uh -huh. you're gonna you're gonna come up a little bit into okay. the belly of the muscle. Okay. Okay. Because the tendons start right in here, back behind the knee. Uh -huh. So you want to come up a little higher into into the muscle belly itself. Um, this ligament, I guess it is. Mm -hmm. That's what's chronic pain, like now that's, as that's well. That's what's getting you. So. Um, is there a certain spot of the uh, hamstring spring string to uh <laughs> so if you're if you're looking to try and hit a certain spot especially if it's more on the outside yeah that take that ball put it more towards the outside of the hamstring okay now i wouldn't put it direct ah, ah, ooh, e. okay so okay. we found it yeah we okay. found it yeah Okay, and and you start <laughs> and you start slow. You don't have to go all the way up if you don't need to. Uh -huh. Start at a point where you know find that entry point where it's not killing you. Okay, and you just start to move it a little bit here until eventually it starts to loosen up. Okay, ten, fifteen repetitions, and then you can maybe even move it up a little bit into a different part of the hamstring. It's like ow, that feels good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So the manual therapy component doesn't always feel the best, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So and I and I hear that a lot. Hurts so good, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're trying to you're trying to just kind of work those muscles loose a little bit and get them to where they're starting to move a little bit more freely. So what that does is it improves blood flow. It also kind of loosens up some of the fascia that's in there. Fascia is connective tissue that kind of encapsulates everything within our body. Okay, so it loosens that up because a lot of times that can get bound down. Now, also you want to make sure that you're hydrating after you do stuff like this. Okay, because as you're doing it, we're kind of pushing fluids out of mm -hmm. out of the muscle in the area where you're pushing on. So like you want to make massage. sure. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you want to make sure that you're rehydrating. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. I know you're Go for it. Um, I'm cashiering. I'm standing for five to six hours. You know, pretty much. You know, in, in that small space of moving, it's different movements that I've noticed from you know years of other movements. Yeah. But um, that you were just talking about ankle, I feel a spot on the inside of my foot and the outside of this ankle that has been throbbing. Yeah. And so it's. I'm wondering, is it a, because of this attachment and up here, if I loosen this muscle up, that will feel better? Or? It's, hard, it's hard to say that without, you know, kind of fully evaluating uh -huh. things. Uh -huh. However, um, <coughs> I, I, oftentimes what I find is it starts with either the ankle or the hip. Okay. That's not 100%. Uh -huh. Not 100%, but oftentimes it starts with the It's just funny that when you were talking about the ankle and the foot, I'm like... <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So that's for the hamstring. So this is, this is kind of my go-to for improving hamstring mobility and improving the, the kind of suppleness of that, that muscle. Besides okay. the feel, is there a difference between the balls? Size. Size. Okay. <laughs> that's well, about one's got little spikies that might yeah. hurt a little bit yeah, more. Yeah. Dig in more. It feels good. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah. Some, some people like the spikes. Some people hate them. So okay. that's why I got you got options. Gotcha. And if you if you like the size, get a, you can have a softball. Or there are other other different tools that you can use that are that are similar. You just kind of have to. It's go, not like one is a them. starter ball and the other is a graduate ball. Not it's necessarily. It's kind of based on you know the feel of the person. What okay. what works? Okay. All right. So that's for your hamstring. Yeah. For your quad. going to be really similar. You're going to kind of pin it down. Now you can do this on the floor actually. You uh -huh. can lay on your belly and you can put the ball directly underneath your quad here and find the spots that are tender and then as you're laying on the floor there you're bending and straightening your knee. Okay and you find that area of the quad that's tender Pin that ball to it and start moving. Okay, it'll be a hurt so good feeling on that as well. Kind of okay. like the roller as well. You've done the foam roller. Well, 
I want you to do a class, but I <laughs> tried it. Like, That's right. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing with the thing, but I'm trying to. Yes, so you can use a foam roller as well. So I'm, I'm trying to show you what you can do with the tools that, you have, that I'm giving you today. But if you wanted to use a foam roller, you can do the same thing. Laying on the floor, pin a spot there on your, in your quad, and you're laying on it with the weight on it, and then you're just bending and straightening the knee. And you can do different areas along, along the knee, or along okay. the front side of the quad there itself. Okay? Um, and, and I would try and work, you know, different areas. Uh, you know, find where it's tender, work that, but also work different areas too. Okay? So 10 or 15 repetitions in each spot. Find three or four spots that you can, yeah, you can do that. Too. Yeah. That one hurts so good. Yeah, right? I always do that rolling thing when I come in here. Yeah, you know. Okay. So, then, what about the calf? Same thing. You're going to lay, or you're going to sit on it here, and you're going to start to pump. The ankle. Can so, you do it on the floor? So, I can show you on the floor. So, you're going to be here. You can put it directly under your calf muscle. And you can add a little bit more weight to it by putting your other foot on top of it. And then you start pumping your ankle. Okay, and the ball might start rolling around a little bit, so you may need to kind of stabilize it. And you can do the same thing there. Find a few different spots. You know, roll it up, come up here. And go up and down with it. What I find most often is the lateral side. The outside of the calf gets really tight, really tender, and, and that's a spot that people they can't stand when I'm pushing on them and, and yeah, doing the manual yeah, stuff yeah, myself. Yeah, uh -huh. Okay, so so getting in there, you'll really get your hurt so good feeling. Okay, and you're gonna work work that area too. Come up close to the knee as well. So you can, not again, not right behind it, mm -hmm. but you're up close there and pumping up and down. Find three or four spots, pump it up 10, 12, 15 times, okay? And then your anterior tibialis, so that's the muscle right on the front of your shin here. So you can do kind of a similar thing. You can put it on a on a chair here and try and stabilize that and pump up and down. Different areas of 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 the muscle. Pump it up and down. And once you do all of this, your leg muscles will, will be a lot more able to move freely. And then again, like I said, make sure you hydrate the muscles too to make sure that you can get in getting fluids in there so that the nutrition and all of that can get, come back in and help with the healing process after you move around and, and beat them up a little bit. <laughs> okay. Now, I said beat them up, but I don't, that doesn't mean go in there and do it for, you know, five hours and, and expect to feel good the next day. It's not going <laughs> to Okay, so just do it for a few minutes at a time. The key is consistency. Okay. So you want to make sure that you're doing this kind of on a daily basis. Have a little bit of a routine that you're going through and doing it all. And, and, and over time, that will help to improve. Again, it won't be immediate, but it will, it will get better if you're consistent with it. Okay? Alright. So, there's the manual therapy component. Now, the next thing you want to be able to do is move without pain. Okay, so this isn't rocket science, but it is neuroscience. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background as to kind of what's going on. So movement of the knee can send signal is going to send signals to your brain. Now, the signal that is being sent is then interpreted by your brain as one or the other, threatening or not threatening, okay? If the brain interprets it as threatening, the output is gonna be a pain response. You're gonna experience pain, okay? 
Now I know how that sounds. The pain's all in your head. No, it's not, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, the pain is real. It's there. <laughs> uh, it's just that you know our brain is what dictates whether something is painful or not. Okay, so with that being the case, the goal then is to be able to reduce the sensitivity of the nervous system and improve the blood flow and nutrition to that area um, rather than cause more irritation. Okay, So the movements that we're doing, the goal is going to be to decrease the nervous system sensitivity so that the signals that are being interpreted by the brain are not threatening. All right? So we want to do that through gradual exposure and gradual increase in movement tolerance. Okay. So we start at, and we find an entry point that is not painful. Okay. And then we do that until we can make step up to the next step. So we gradually increase. We gradually increase. A really good example of this and how quickly it can happen. I worked with a patient one time who had a hip problem. And I put her on the treadmill. We started walking. And at, I think it was 2.8 miles per hour, once we got, we got her to 2.8 miles per hour, she was having all sorts of pain in her hip. So then what I did was I backed it all the way down to a point of entry that was not painful was about 1.8, I think, was where I, where I started her. Walked for two minutes at 1.8, bumped it up another two tenths, bumped it up another two tenths, bumped it up another two tenths, until we got to 3.6 before she experienced any sort of pain. Okay, so we found an entry point that was non-painful. The signals that were being sent to the brain were, the brain was not interpreting it as threatening and then we gradually increased over time. And this was in a span of however long it takes going every two minutes by two tenths of a mile an hour, maybe 20 minutes. We got from being able, not being able to walk 2.8 miles per hour without pain to suddenly she could do 3.6 without any pain. So the cool thing is our brains can actually make that adjustment that took 20 minutes. It was fairly quick. Imagine what you can do over a period of days, weeks, months, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're doing here. That's why you need the consistency though, okay? So the consistency of doing these things is going gonna, gonna to continue to send these signals to the brain that this is not threatening and then, um, and then eventually you can do more and more and more with it without having a lot of pain. Okay, so what movements do we actually choose in order to do this? Well, again, it's not rocket science. You can do whatever works and whatever is not going to cause any more increased stresses to, to the joint itself. Okay. So what are some examples? So quad sets for patellar mobility, and also they give you a little bit of extra strengthening. So quad sets are going to be where you're sitting on a flat surface, and I'll, and I'll do it this way. So you're sitting on a flat surface, so your leg's laying uh, flat on that surface, okay? Now, your, your foot is, your, your leg is relaxed here, and then what, what you wanna do is get a little bit of mobility in your, in your kneecap. So what you do is contract your quad muscle, and you'll see my kneecap moves just a little bit, okay? So you're getting nice gentle mobility to the kneecap without putting a lot of stress on it. Okay, so that's an entry point, right? You're giving it something that it can do, that it can send these signals to the brain that it's not painful, and then you can start to, you know, start to do more and more and more stuff with it. So then a progression from that would then be to do a short or long arc quad extension, okay? So again, I'll bring up something where you can just bend the knee just a little bit.
short arc quad would be something where you're actually moving the leg now here. And you're still using the same muscles, but now you're actually getting a little bit of movement in there. Okay? So this is a short arc quad because it's only a small movement, it's short, short arc movement. Okay? Then a long arc quad, anybody guess? Not squats, we're, we're not there yet. <laughs> a long arc quad would then be here. So you start at 90 degrees and you got a much longer motion. Okay? And then you gradually work to squats. <laughs> okay? So it takes time to get there though. Okay? Especially if you've had knee pain for a long time. Okay? If it's a chronic issue, it takes longer to rewire the brain to be able to perceive something like this as not that painful. deranged brain. That <laughs> deranged knee <laughs> brain <laughs> pain. Yes. Stuck on that word. <laughs> <laughs> you like that <laughs> word, huh? <laughs> okay. So so yeah, long arc quad. So that's a good a good motion as well. Now, I'm also going to show you tibial, internal, and external rotation. Now, let, let me just clarify something. Remember this motion here is part of the reason we got into these problems in the first place, right? So, why in the world would I have you do this? Well, because we're actually doing it without any load on the joint at all. So those stresses aren't actually all that, all that severe. But it's giving it a little bit of a novel input in there without the excessive load so it can start to improve um, the ability to, to move and do things without as much pain. Does that make sense? So those are some examples. Again, it, it depends on um, what works. So for somebody, maybe this is just too painful and they can't do any sort of internal and external rotation at all, so we find something different. Maybe it's a hamstring curl that works better than, than a quad motion, okay? So, you know, you just kind of have to find what works and what's painful. Find that entry point for each person. It may be different for you as it is for you, okay? So we just find what works and then gradually work from there. Once you get to a point where you can move fairly pain-free, then you start to kind of move and groove that new motor pattern that you that you that you're that we're trying to relearn okay so the goal then like i said create new movement patterns and endurance to build upon uh, to build your new strength and stability and and skills on top of okay so those come later in the process remember in the three r's it's a little bit later in the process that you start building that strength stability and the, those more functional skills, but first you need to groove the proper motor patterns, okay? So motor control and endurance are best achieved with a lot of repetition and very low resistance, okay? So if you're running a marathon, you're not going to go sprinting out because you'll last about 10 seconds, right? You'll go nice and easy, nice and slow. And, and you can go for a much longer period of time, okay? Now, with motor control and endurance, um, you're going to, uh, instead of doing heavy weight stuff, so like I, like I showed you, we were doing the short arc quad, for example. You're gonna start with very little weight because, and you're gonna do a lot of reps, 20 to 30 repetitions as opposed to throwing a 10 pound weight on your ankle and trying to kick it up because that's going to put excessive stress on the patella. It's going to put excessive stress on, on the joint of the knee. Same thing with here. So, you know, if we're putting weight on this internal and external rotation, that's going to just cause it to flare up even further. It's not going to, it's not going to make it feel better. Okay. So this stuff needs to happen a lot. A lot, a lot, so to build the endurance and to build this new motor pattern. So basically, in essence, 
practice makes perfect. So you just do it over and over and over again until this new motor pattern becomes your pattern. This is you. This is, this is, it becomes part of just your normal thing. Okay. So I'm going to give a little bit of an example. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping you guys can follow me on this. Who knows what an oxbow lake is? Good. All right. I get to, <laughs> I get to explain this. Yeah. Okay. So, so an oxbow lake is a lake that used to be part of a river, but over time, the kind of the earth has been worn away and replaced to the point where the lake is separate from the river itself. Okay. So, what, what does that have anything to do with anything, right? So, this doesn't happen over time, first of all, or this doesn't happen quickly, it happens over time. So it's continually water running through here and starting to cut through the land a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, okay? Until eventually it connects and then this part of the lake gets completely, this part of the river gets completely separated from the from the rest of the river, okay? So, again, this happens over time. It happens because of repetition. Water continually running through, running through, running through, all right? That's kind of the idea of doing these motor pattern, the, these new motor relearning exercises and these endurance exercises. Um, and what it, what's happened now? It's, it's formed a completely new pattern. So it was a much bigger kind of whatever meandering, I don't know. It was a much larger kind of turn there. Now it's kind of shortened up. So we've completely changed the pattern of the river, right? Now in S, I mean, what could happen is it could actually happen again here, and it could straighten out entirely. So whether that will happen or not, I don't know. But basically you could do it. So, um, and what, what then happens there is the, the thing completely, completely straightens out. So if we're thinking then about the foot, let's kind of use an example. If your normal pattern is this severe pronation, okay, then you do a lot of um, endurance and motor control exercises help improve it so it stays more neutral. See what I mean? So that eventually your body gets used to that and that becomes its new its new motor pattern and now suddenly you're walking without all this extra um, all this extra motion in your ankle which is putting less stress on the knee. Right? Same thing at the hip. You know, if you improve if you do the motor motor relearning in the hip and then you and then you start walking, then you get less of those stresses at the knee. Okay. So, what I want to do, um, <laughs> well, and then there we go. So, what what did we determine is most often the cause of knee pain? Probably not the knee. It's usually the hip or the ankle, right? And it's usually control at the hip or the ankle. Okay. So that's why we're doing these motor control type of exercises. So then let me show you some things that you can do for motor control, okay? So these are, these are kind of the basic starting point of where you start with these, these motor learning exercises is if, if somebody's got hip weakness, I'm probably gonna start them with a clamshell, okay? So what's a clamshell? Can you throw me one of those bands? So a clamshell <coughs> is going to be you're going to take this band and you're going to wrap it around your knees. And tie it out. You can do this 
you can start really, really basic and do it in a sitting position, which is where we're at right now. So we'll start here, and we're just going to push out here. And what you'll see is over a period of 10, 15, 20 repetitions, you'll really start to feel your hip muscles start to activate. So you're starting the process of motor pattern relearning in your hip muscles to be able to hold your hip in a more neutral position. Okay? So I'll start people if it's really if they if they need it to be really basic, I'll start people in a sitting position here. I'll then move them into a side lying position here and then they're pushing up. Like in the in the handouts? The, the, the name of them are, I don't have a okay. demonstration okay. of it. No. Okay. Um, so, this is kind of your, your, your basic, right? And then you can move from there into more of a standing and actually pushing out to the side here. So, we're, I'm just kind of showing you some of these little progressions here mm -hmm. that you can kind of go through. All right? And you can actually do side steps. Okay, you've seen them. <laughs> no, no, yeah. And those are for hips as well? This is for hip as well. Mm -hmm. So all of this is acting to abduct the hip or keep right. the hip out to the mm -hmm. side rather than letting it fall into the inside. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Does it matter where you have it on your leg for the hip? So the higher it is, so if you're doing sidestepping, yeah. mm -hmm. the higher it is, the easier it's going to be. Oh, the lower it is, <laughs> the lower it is, the harder it's going to be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if it's up here, the lever is is really short, so you're okay. so you're only having to push that. But if it's here, you're having to push. You know, it, it, okay. the, the lever's a lot longer. Cool. Okay. So some hip strengthening exercises. But again, remember, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. Okay. It happens <laughs> with repetition in practice, okay? So, a couple of sets of 30 on those will give you a lot of, uh, we'll start to re, re, um, redevelop that motor pattern, okay? Now, we'll move down into the foot and ankle, okay? So the foot and ankle is a little, um, it's similar. It's going to be, you know, trying to relearn a motor pattern. So. As I mentioned earlier, pronation is the biggest issue, right? So if we get this pronation and this kind of flattening of the foot where it rolls to the inside, what you want to try and work on is actually activating those muscles that I showed you in the lower leg and in the foot itself to be able to lift the arch up again. Okay, so if you're looking at my hand here, it rolls flat. You want to activate the muscles inside of the foot and up in the upper leg, or the lower leg, to be able to lift and hold that arch in place. Okay? So then, what, you, what you're trying to do, and yeah, we can take shoes off and, and demonstrate. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and do that. I was wondering, is there something, because right in this area, I have a burning sensation, okay. which has, the, I mean, in you know, the outside of the ankle, is there something to do with the band or the ball, other than rub it, I guess, if it feels good, do it. But I mean, to help, um, I got really good shoes now mm -hmm. um, and good inserts and stuff, but uh, something because it's it's very burny feeling. That could be a little bit of a nerve impingement or something like that. Uh -huh. um, I'm impinged everywhere. You're impinged everywhere. <laughs> yeah. everywhere. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there are some manual therapy things that you can do down in the lower leg because uh -huh. the nerves the nerves pass through the leg down into the foot. Um, I wasn't sure if that like pain that. had to do with the pain on the outside of the knee right here. It's hard to say. It could be. Uh -huh. It could okay. be. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> all right. So where you want to start with these arch lifts is you want to start, first of all, with no weight on your foot. Okay. So you're just doing it in a sitting position here. All right, but the goal is to keep your big toe on the ground, your, your base of your big toe on the ground, and your heel on the ground. All right, so right now my foot is rolled kind of flat, so then what I want to do is lift the arch here. 
Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm activating muscles in my lower leg and inside of my foot to lift that arch. And it's a very subtle motion. Oh, so just kind of pull your toes in. Cause so, that's so, so basically you're trying to yeah, shorten your foot a little bit. Okay. There, and it lifts the arch. All right. Okay. Good. Yeah. And then once you learn it in a sitting position, then you can stand because it's a lot harder when you stand and put weight on it to be able to support that. So first you got to teach the muscles how to do it in a, in a low weight, high repetition environment. And then you add the weight to it and you're, and you're starting, to, starting to do it there. Okay. And then watch what happens from the front. To my, to my ankle. See how my ankle, right now it's relaxed and it's falling flat and it's going to the inside. If I lift the arch, the whole lower leg and foot becomes neutral. Okay, so then I'm walking over a neutral foot, which puts less of that twisting and, and stress on my lower leg and less stress on the knee. Okay? You can feel the weakness in those little bones up in the ankle here when you do that. Yeah, yeah. And if, if you haven't if you haven't worked to activate these these muscles in a long time, it's going to take a lot of practice on those. How about when you're standing with your shoes on at the register? Is that something that you can do in there or? Absolutely. Okay. I Absolutely. Know that would be better with the shoe off. Well, not. I mean, it, it's good to do. You know, a. a, a um, can't really do it with a shoe off. <laughs> I yeah. like to have my shoes off, but I can't do that. Yeah, it's good to have a focused practice of it, uh -huh. you know, when you get home and take your shoes off and all of that. Right. Um, but it's also really good to be paying attention to it throughout the day. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you're kind of paying attention to, well, you're just standing and working and you're paying attention to your feet being in the right position, and, and then that's a really good thing that you should be doing anyway. Again, it's practice makes perfect, right? So you should be continually trying to work on this. Okay? Yeah. All right. So, that's what we covered. <laughs> so that's what we covered, right? We, we kind of worked, worked out the kinks a little bit. I showed you some things that you can do and work on with that. Um, and I helped you to give you some ideas of how you can start to move without pain, you know, and some different stuff that you can do. But remember, it's kind of whatever works for you in your particular situation. It just takes consistency with it because practice makes perfect, right? And then moving and grooving, you know, you're finding those, those motor patterns that, uh, that you need to retrain in order to not put as much stress on the knee. So then, what do you want out of, out of it, you know? How far do you want to take it? Where do you want to go? You know, do you just want to get to a point where you're walking without pain? And that's fine. If that's, if that's your goal, go for it. If you want to move further and get to your ultimate goal, you, which, you know, whether that's running a 5K or a marathon or whatever it is, or, or, or just being able to walk 20 minutes in your neighborhood. I don't, I don't know what it is for you. Um, but, you know, this is the process that you kind of go through uh, as, you, as, you, as you walk through it, okay? So that's all for today. Thank you guys. And do y'all have any questions? Does that help with balance as well? Because I'm finding as I mature, <laughs> just that chronologically, not mentally, but um, <laughs> that uh, my balance is getting a little wonky and then, you know, the inner ear type thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and balance is another thing that requires a lot of kind of repetition, right? It's one of those things you got to move it and groove it. So you need to practice those things pretty often, but... Um, do you yeah. do balance classes? I don't do balance classes. I do do um, balance rehab stuff. That's okay. I guess that's yeah, what I yeah, mean. Yeah. Because yeah. I do PT I guess for something simple like that, we don't really realize what would be things to practice on to right. you know, get better yeah, balance. I, I absolutely do PT for balance, for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
Absolutely. What other questions, guys? All right. Well, thank you guys for for joining me.